Jesus gives him the invitation to come and follow him. You know, Jesus never says no to a step of faith. He might repurpose it, he might redirect it, he might re-engage it, but he never says no. A series that we've been looking at of walking with God, an adventure of faith. And um, I just caught part of what Helen shared last week, which was just, it's just so refreshingly true that the Bible actually just gives us warts and all of human beings and their relationship with God. And uh, it, that's just amazing. You know, you think of some of them in the Bible, you think, well, I wouldn't give you the time of day. But actually God gives them all the time of day. From people like Abraham who weren't too sure and Sarah who disbelieved and then on to the likes of Jacob who lied and lied a bit more and and then Moses who murdered, and David who murdered, and David who didn't know what he was doing, and then disciples who believed one moment, and then they didn't believe another moment, and so it goes on. And yet God wants to walk with us. I don't know where you're at this morning in your walk with God. Uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, then your life is probably going to be something like this if we were to draw it out. It's going to be up here down here, up here, down here, maybe a lot of this, a bit down here, up here, because it's never static. The walk of faith is never static. But one of the things I want to just share with you as we look into the Word of God this morning is that Jesus is always watching. Jesus is always praying. Jesus always wants to encourage you. And Jesus always stretches his hand out to you. I'll say that again. Jesus is always watching, he's always praying, he's always wanting to encourage you, and he's always wanting to stretch his hand out to you in your circumstances. Uh, you'll have missed this for sure, but as you come through the front of the, uh, I'm moving this away because I'm bound to trip over that bit of plug. Um, as you come through there on the mural there, there is a little, there's plenty of pictures and words and things and stuff that we believe. And then there's this little quote that's at the front there. If you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. And it's a quote from a book called John, from John Ertberg, which actually is thinking about the person that we're going to be looking at. Peter in Matthew chapter 14. Go and find it. Go and see it. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. Now, I love water. I love being by it, in it, under it, and on it. All of those things. Um, but there's plenty of times when I've been in it, not out of choice. I was uh, once sailing with uh, Barry, Barry, do you remember this? We were Steve King on a yacht, and we were heading down Bodmin. And um, there was a, some of you have also done a few trips with Steve King. And uh, we are at this boat, and we'd, we'd come up. I can't remember which wharf it was. And uh, we'd parked there, and I was supposed to be the, uh, the tender boy. So I was looking up, inflate the tender, put the engine on the back, and then ferry people back and forward. I think they were going to the pub, but don't tell anybody. So <laughs> I was taking them back and forward, and then I was absolutely thirsty myself, so I thought, I'll go and have a drink. And I was chef that night as well, so uh, no alcohol, honest. It was just off I went, had a drink with the lads, came back, and then I had to be chef. Now, Steve said, um, who was our captain of that day, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a lift so that um, we've got the boat back here, fine. So he jumps into the boat, undoes the lashing. I jump into the boat, but he wasn't holding on to the side. So the boat went one way, and I didn't fall back onto the pontoon. I went down, 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 straight into the water. Well, he laughed himself silly that he couldn't help me in any way but shape or form, and actually refused, so I had to swim to get back, so there was no hand, there was no encouragement, he was just laughing himself absolutely silly. So why am I telling you about this? Because I didn't walk on water. There's only two people that we have credited in the Bible who walked on water. One is Jesus, and then there's another character called Peter. You can find the account of Jesus walking in water in Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke doesn't bother to record it. 
But Matthew is the only gospel writer that actually records that Peter walks on water. The others, it's not really important to them. They probably got on okay with Peter as a mate, as a disciple, but they thought he's had enough of the limelight. He doesn't need to have any more. And it's only Matthew, who's writing to the Jews as well, actually tells something that Jesus says to Peter. The other gospel writers don't. And it's this. So Matthew acknowledges that Peter's going to walk on the water and sink. But he also acknowledges that Jesus said to Peter, on this rock I will build my church. Just pause for a moment. We're going to engage a character who walked on water, began to drown because of his lack of faith, and yet Jesus says to him, I'm going to choose you as one of the primaries to build my church. Um, that gives me hope. I don't know about you, but it gives me So we're going to have a look at the scriptures together, Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to unpick it as we go along. The little backdrop to this Matthew chapter 14 is that uh, Jesus has just fed the crowds, um, the 15,000 or the 5,000, with the others probably 15,000, and uh, they've done that, tired and weary, and Jesus then decides to do stuff. So Matthew 14. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. Jesus, let's just pause here. Jesus put them on the boat. He knew that they needed rest. He's done this before. In Matthew chapter 8, you can see that actually Jesus put them on the boat. And he got on the boat because they needed rest. And we'll come back to that story in a moment, but let's press on. After he dismissed them, he went up onto the mountainside by himself to pray. If you read through the Gospels, you see that Jesus often took himself aside to pray. The last time he took himself aside where his disciples were nearby was to pray for his disciples to pray for them, to intercede to them on behalf of the Father. But he knew that they needed rest. And we have in the Scriptures time and time again, and the New Testament tells us that seated at the right hand of the Father now is Jesus who is interceding on our behalf. Today, King Jesus, who we've just sung about, is telling Father God, your needs, your joys, your hardships. And he's just saying, Father, they need this. Father, bless them for this. Let's press on. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Life was against them. They thought they were going to have rest. They thought, yeah, we've just done our bit. We've just fed the 5,000 with Jesus. That was a high. And now things are suddenly going wrong. It's before them. It's stressful. When you read the other accounts, it was the late night. They were rowing. They were trying to get stuff doing and happening. But they weren't getting anywhere. Let's just pause a moment. Did Jesus know that they were going to be in trouble when he put them on the boat? Yes. Hold on a moment. That's not, is Jesus that unfair? Jesus knew they needed rest. Jesus knew that actually something else needed to happen at this time. But he still puts them on the boat. Do you remember Matthew 8 and some of the other gospel narratives as well? They've been doing ministry. Jesus got on the boat with them. And what happened? A storm came up. The waves came over the boat. Where was Jesus? He was at the front asleep, as if he didn't worry, as if he he wasn't worried about the fact that they were close to death. And they would say, Jesus, come on. Look what's happening. We're almost drowning here. 
And then he gets up and he just says a few words. Be still. And all it says in the gospel writers, they were amazed at who he was. They hadn't connected fully who he was, but they were amazed. Now, I wonder in your life when you've been on the journey with Jesus and sometimes it gets a bit awkward and it gets a bit difficult and it gets a bit hard. You go, Jesus, aren't aren't you awake? Don't you know what's happening to me? And the only words he's going to give you is, be still. I'm in control. Be still. The other gospel writers acknowledge that it was just before the dawn. Now, if you know your topography, that's the geography or looking down on where the Sea of Galilee is, the Lake of Galilee, then actually it's surrounded by hills. So it didn't matter where they were on the lake, Jesus could have seen them. It doesn't matter where you are in your circumstances. If you're being buffeted around and it feels like you're not getting anywhere very fast and you can't see a solution to your problems because they're overwhelming you, I just want to say to you, Jesus can see you. He's watching over you. He hasn't forgotten you. You're not in his pending file. You're not somewhere like, I can't get to you because I've got others to look after. He sees you. Shortly before dawn, verse 25, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Now, the other gospel writers say he was about to pass them by. Why was that? Well, again, you can read as many theological texts as well, whatever you'd like to look at. But one suggestion is a bit like when God passed Moses by. He was about to declare his presence. Job, when he was suffering, and uh, if you ever feel low, Job's a great book to go to for the reality of someone just holding on to God with fingertips. Job, in his revelation and thinking processes, he declares um, in chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 8, he says, it's only God who can tread on the water. It's if he's alluding to the one who can come, who is only God, who can quite literally tread on the water. Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Time does not give us uh, a moment for me to talk about ghosts. There are definitely spiritual beings that we can see and, and have their presence and acknowledge their beings. Angels are accounted for, demons are accounted for. Um, But the ghosts about spiritual human beings coming back into this space and time, that's another day for another story. If you want to book half an hour with uh, Andy or Callie or me or George or anybody, we'll happily share all about that. But let's say this, what the scriptures say, they cried out in fear. They were terrified. It's not going well. It's not a happy moment being a follower of Jesus at this point. It was like, flipping heck, what's going on? And now look what's coming. And sometimes we don't always recognize Jesus. Jesus hadn't abandoned them. We know he'd been praying. We know he'd been watching them. And now he comes alongside them. And what's the first words he said to them? He doesn't say, Oi, stupid. He says, Take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Take courage. Jesus always wants to encourage us to walk with him. It is I. Plenty of times Jesus has said, using that word I about other things, I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All he needed to say, it is I, that's enough. It's I, I'm coming close to you. And what does he say? Don't be afraid. I don't know about you, but there is time and time and time again in my walk with Jesus, I'm afraid. I feel like the little boy that I once was. 
I feel, what are you doing, God? Where are you? I just can't face this. What more of this? Oh, goodness me, I'm afraid. And yet time and time again, the scriptures remind us, and some would say there's over 365 day promises of God about not being afraid. Well, there's a few, definitely. Things like don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow is enough worries of itself. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. In due time, the Lord will make it. You know all these. And so he's been praying, he's been watching, and now he's near them and encouraging them. And what do the guys on the boat do? Well, they're still probably fearful because they haven't seen any action yet apart from this ghostly figure talking to them saying, don't be afraid, it is I. And what happens? Peter speaks up. And what does he say? Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, I don't know whether Peter got lessons of uh, cleverness or lessons. We're told that he's uh, um, described as the sons of thunder. So, you know, he's a boom bust kind of guy. He's, um, he's that kind of individual. He's definitely out there, then suddenly all in there. But there's Peter saying, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, I just, let's just think about what happened before. Uh, this is the way my mind works. Yours probably doesn't. I wonder if the guys in the boat said, um, actually, do you think that's Jesus? Are we just hallucinating? Did we have a funny lunch? Well, we did. Five loaves and two fishes. You know, what's the deal here? Did they have a special prayer meeting? They might have got, is this Jesus actually out there? Let's just pray about this. Did Peter actually did a risk assessment? That's why I'm always asked. Have you done a risk assessment about what you're going to do? And um, uh, did he do a forward subjective analysis of the outcomes of what was going to happen when he stepped on the water? Did he say to the guys, let's pray and let's see what happens? No, he just goes, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out of the water. Well, that's not a plan. Is that a plan? If it's you, then let me walk out in the water. And Jesus, and I, I, I guess Peter didn't go, oh, it's a bit cold. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> or, you know, like, like we do with Brits as we get into the sea. Uh, it didn't do any of that. What did Jesus say? One word. Come. Verse 29. Just come. Jesus gives him the invitation to come and follow him. You know, Jesus never says no to a step of faith. He might repurpose it. He might redirect it. He might re-engage it. But he never says no. Later, Matthew records in Matthew 16, Then Jesus told his disciples, If any would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And so Peter puts one leg over the boat. And if it were me, I'd be going, oh, yeah, that's quite solid. Right, okay. Over the next one goes. And he says, hmm, I got this. Jesus says, come, I'm all for it. And as he stepped out in faith, the scriptures tell the reality. And Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came forward to Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And before we get on to what Jesus did, do you think the disciples were going, I told you so, we should have had that prayer meeting. Do you think they were going, it's safer in the boat, even though the waves are crashing over it? 
Where was their mind? 31. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why do you doubt? Jesus had prayed. Jesus had watched them. Jesus had drawn close to them. Jesus had invited them. And Jesus, the one who stretched out his arms on a cross to show that he loved us and could save us, is still today the one who, when we cry, Jesus, will you save me? Lord, save me. He goes, yes, I will. The scriptures say, for all those who call on my name will be saved. And today, we don't have the presence of Jesus, but we have the presence of the Spirit that lives with each one of us who love Jesus. And we are his hands and his feet for those who are drowning, for those who are saying, save me, help me. We are the ones who help them back into the boat to meet Jesus. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him. You of little faith, he said, why do you doubt? And then he climbed into the boat and the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When Jesus had quietened the wind in Matthew chapter 8 before, because they've had a few boat stories already, they just thought he was amazing. Now, because of the trial and suffering and some of the pain that they'd gone through, something had changed in them. He wasn't just amazing. They now could acknowledge that he was the Son of God. And today, ladies and gentlemen, here this morning, if you feel that you're drowning, if you feel that life has got on top of you, if you feel that the boat is getting away with you, if you're disappointed with God, I just want to say this as I started. Jesus is always watching. Jesus is always praying. Jesus will always draw near to those who want him to draw near to. Jesus always saves those who call out to be saved. Jesus, how can he do that? Because he is the son of God. There's no other son of God. We are sons and daughters of a living God, but not the son of God of God. He's the one who holds that title. He's the one who's the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. He's the one who's able to draw near to you. I'll finish with this story. Um, uh, I've never learned how to swim. I think I've told you this before, but I can swim because I was an experiment by my brothers. Um, they'd watch Boo Peter, uh, my brothers are slightly older than me, and they'd watch that actually if you put a baby, as opposed to what they did to me, <laughs> if you put a baby in the water, they swim. So we were in Buckler's Hard, and we were on this, my dad's had a yacht at the time, my brothers were on there, my dad was down at the helm, they were just mooring up, and they decided to see whether this actually was a scientific fact. So they lobbed me over the side. Um, you know, that was it. And there you go. And down I went, glug, 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 glug. And up I came, glug, 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 glug. And then my brothers started running for their life as my father was chasing after them. And um, I'm told that I was fished out with, a, with a, a boy stick, or boy boom as they're called, which is to get hold of the bone with the hook, so they fished me out. Anyway, why do I tell you that? Because it's amazing what you can do when Jesus is about. Because seemingly impossible for me not to swim, uh, but I did. 
seemingly impossible for Peter not to walk on water, but he did for a bit. And you know, when we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, he will be near you as he was to Peter. And as we worship now, the guys who come up, we're going to sing, it's dutifully called Oceans. You know the song? <laughs> but I always remember this picture. I've seen this, this hymn, this song, this big battleship in the middle of the ocean. Huge, looked really big, massive. And you sometimes see, haven't you, if you see it on YouTube or some of the geographic things, these big battleships as they're going to hit some of these big waves. It's not for me. <laughs> but the waves are crashing over. And sometimes you see these big battleships and they're in the water. And then this camera just zooms out and out and out and out and out. And that battleship is just like a little something in the middle of this vast ocean. God, by his grace and by his mightiness, is bigger than any ocean. And King Jesus is able. So as you walk with Jesus, whether you're in difficulty, whether you think it's impossible, I don't encourage you to walk on water. <laughs> but for Peter, it was made possible for a moment.